The digital divide is inevitable because it's the outcome of the diffusion of technology. And technology doesn't fall uniformly like mana from heaven. It, it diffuses through social network and that takes time. And it will inevitably create always a divide between the have and the have nots. Second of all, it unfortunately is here to stay because technology evolves as well. It becomes better. And as soon as some digital technology has diffused, a new one is already coming through the pipeline and this divide is opened up again. So there we are about to close it and it opens up again. We're about to close it and opens up again. So it is an issue that is far, far from being solved and it's actually intensifying as we enter new technological digital innovations. And it should concern us and it should concern us all because it's a real, it's a new dimension of inequality. It's the form of inequality of information, communication, and knowledge. And we know knowledge is power. And as the digital paradigm progresses towards knowledge and algorithms, it creates an inequality. And who has access? Well, who has access to the artificial intelligence? Who has that? Well, that also depends who has access to the communication networks. The artificial intelligence lives somewhere, so you need to be connected to it. And the vast majority of the world has very little bandwidth to be connected to that. So the digital divide actually has long concerned us. And, and I was, it was the main majority of my research focus when I researched these topics at the United Nations, how we can bridge the digital divide, what matters for the digital divide. And that's what I want to talk about here in this lecture. And I tried to make it short, but as I said, I could extend myself very extensively on here, but I want to go take a little bit more time because this is not slowing down. The pictures I show you here, you're kind of like, ah, what does that have to do with the modern times? Actually, the digital divide opens up again with every new technological innovation. And as we progress to the world of artificial intelligence and simulation and digital twins and the metaverse, the access problem is actually becoming much, much more severe. In order to be in the metaverse, in a 3D reality, you need an amazing amount of, comp of, of, of storage capacity, of computational capacity. In order to run artificial intelligence, you need an amazing amount of computational capacity, and that is not available. That is actually, you need to gather that, and, and we haven't solved it by far. So some of us will enter the metaverse much earlier than others. Some of us will reap the benefits of artificial intelligence much earlier than others. And that will create, again, a, a new dimension of inequality, additionally to all the inequalities we already have. And we have inequality with regard to income, education, gender, race, ethnicity, and now we have, like it wouldn't be enough, right? Now we have the broadband and the com supercomputer inequality. So that's what we need to talk about. So let's go very schematic about it. This is a little framework I came up with, and it turned out to be very useful. Many other scholars as well found it to be useful, and, and we've been working with that. And these are four perspectives of how you can analyze the digital divide. And so I started being a good scholar of communication networks, uh, followed Everett Rogers' lead and said, okay, so the digital divide has to do with the diffusion of innovation. And Professor Everett Rogers told us the diffusion of innovation has to do with social networks. So let's just draw out a social network and see what we can get. Now we have a social network here and we have a divide between those who are already infected with the innovation, with the digital technology and those who have not. So we have a divide between the have and they have not. So I color the nodes when they, they have and adopt it. Now, we first question is, what is a node? Who? Could be a country, an organization, an individual. Uh, and what are the characteristics? Like, can we somehow say that the ones that are connected have some kind of characteristic? Maybe they're richer. Maybe they're just more creative. Who knows? Maybe they're more adventurous. Uh, maybe they have a certain gender. Well, now let's see, what are the characteristics of these nodes? So are they nodes or triangles? And then the question is to connect how? So how do we connect to, to this technology? When do we draw the line? When do we say the divide is closed? When you have access 
or when you actually efficiently use it? Is it enough to like throw technology on people on society or do they have actually to make efficient use of it? When is the divide closed? And then last question is to what? What technology do they connect to? What technology do we connect to? What is the technology that matters? Is it a phone? Or is it an in, a, a fixed line connection? Is it a fiber optic cable? Uh, does it have to have a certain bandwidth? What kind of computer is it? Is it a computer that can you know, run some apps or does it have to be a graphics card that can simulate a metaverse? So these four questions then lead us to this framework on how to characterize the digital divide. It's how, with which characteristics, connects how to what. And two of them is kind of like you characterize the nodes of the network. So it has to do with a social network, the diffusion of innovation, the definition, what is a node? What are you, what are you looking at actually? What are you concerned about? And the second is, what is the divide? When is which node on which side? Like what is the technology aspect of it? So we have the social and the technology aspect of it. And it turns out that if you look at it from these four perspectives, we have learned that it's actually quite useful in order to design policies as well. So that's why I want you to walk you through this framework and understand it a little bit better. And with that, understand a little bit better what this discussion and this concern of the digital divide is about. All right, so let's start with the first one. Who, like, okay, so who are you worried about? <laughs> one of my former bosses at the United Nations always used to say that men, and, and I think especially men, I think he literally meant that, men don't think with their head, they think with their behind actually, because depending on the chair their behind is sit sitting in, they think differently. And that's true, so if you sit at the United Nations, you think about countries and about the world. Now, if you sit in a chair of a local district, you think about municipalities. And when you sit as a chair in a family, you think about family members. So what is actually the digital divide can also be within a family. Maybe the young kids do some things and the old ones in the family household don't. So what is, who is, what do we define as a node? What represents a node? Well, it can be individuals. So here, for example, we looked up female business owners on Facebook. And we can see here between female business owners and we have a difference at times. We see the progression of how more female in different countries adopt Facebook as a tool for being business. And these are very small business. These are female entrepreneurs. And so the digital divide with regard to that here of individual female entrepreneurs is closing. We can also look at organizations. For example, we can look at companies, we can look at schools, or we can look at municipalities, at local governments. There's a divide. I mean, this is a study we did here at the UN, 2004, 2007. You see how local governments adopted email. Well, that was a big innovation, and there the innovation diffuses in society, right? Or it could be countries. I already talked about that, the digital divide between Different countries, some of them are more ahead than others. And I'm not going to hit on individual countries again. Sorry about that. But yeah, some are more, more connected than other countries. Now, countries are useful because here you have a, you have a telephone number to call, right? It's the, it's the national government and say like, hey, look, something here is going on. Let's close the digital divide with neighboring countries, but it can also be within that countries or among regions of countries. So here we have low income countries, high income countries. So whatever you make a note, Actually, that's just in the eye of the beholder of the modeler of the social network. And it doesn't have to actually be something social. It can also be an app. Here, what we did is we looked at the diffusion of apps. So there's a divide in the amount of apps, social networking apps that have been downloaded during the pandemic of COVID-19. And we can see that when people spend less time in parks, that means social distancing, they're not allowed to hang out in parks, that means when we detect less mobile phones hanging around in parks, we see that people download more social networking apps, especially in Argentina, Che here. They were like, hey, can I see my friends in the parks? I'm gonna immediately download the social networking apps. And you can see actually a divide here. Well, whatever you wanna model the digital divide. So that's the first question. Who, but what is a node in your, in your social network? Second, what, what technology? are you talking about? Are you talking about phone, the internet and broadband? And that leads us to a very ancient question, like when is enough enough? What, what technology is actually necessary and sufficient 
Considering the technological progress, we can go back to the founding, the founding fathers of social science, actually, the founding scholars of social science. Let's go to good old Adam Smith from the 17th century, one of the founders of, of the discipline of economics. What did Adam Smith say when he talked about the wealth of nations? When is enough enough? So 1776, we say. By necessaries, I understand not only the commodities which are indispensably necessary for the support of life, but whatever the customs of the country renders it indecent for credible people, even the lowest order to be without. A linen shirt, for example, is strictly speaking not a necessary of life. The Greeks and Romans are lived, I suppose, very comfortably, so they had no linen. But in the present times of 1776, through the greater part of Europe, a credible day laborer would be ashamed to appear in public without a linen shirt. The want of which would be supposed to denote that disgraceful degree of poverty, which it is presumed nobody can well fall into without extreme bad conduct. Custom in the same manner has rendered leather shoes a necessary of life in England. The poorest credible person of either sex would be ashamed to appear in public without them. Okay, so he would say, well, a necessity is linen shirts and leather shoes. And these innovations, technological innovations, it diffused and people adopted them. And that was then the necessary and sufficient. Well, the necessary would be food and shelter. And there you have Maslow's pyramid. But then he said like, no, 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 no. The custom of the country renders it to be expected to have an iPhone 10, 15, 20, 5? Like, what is necessary and sufficient? Like, where, where do we go? So the divide is also ongoing. And some countries, you know, have that. For example, in Europe, some countries in their social a social support system, which, you know, here in the United States, we, we, we would call it food stamps. We go really to the lowest bar. But in some countries with social support, a family living in poverty, when they have a child in school age, they have a right for a computer with internet connection. The state will buy it for them because they say, no, no child can be at home nowadays and be in school without a laptop and an internet connection. And also in many countries, was in the United States during the COVID-19 pandemic, when kids were studying at home with public funds, Computers were bought. Now, which kind of computer do you need to connect to your educational right as a child in elementary school? And who should who should render this to you? How what is the technology that closes the digital divide? Well, it's a moving target and that makes it so complicated. So here, for example, I can show you is that the divide is closing with regard to amount of equipment. And usually we would say, like, if people have a digital equipment, the divide is closed, right? So as long as they have something to connect and then they are connected, they are connected to the internet. So let's whatever, give them a computer with an internet connection and or give them a phone, as long as the phone is a 2G phone and it can connect to the internet, fine, they are connected. And you can see that the number of devices over time, this compares the year 2000, the high income countries had eight times more devices than the rest of the world. And in the year 2007, this divide was reduced to only three times more. So the high income countries had eight times more. And then a few years later, the rest of the world caught up technological devices were diffused on the rest of the world and the gap was from eight reduced to three times more. Great, the digital divide is closing with regard to devices. But is that the entire story? Because it's a moving target. I mean, you might have a phone, but what kind of phone do you have? What can, Do you have a 2G phone that allows you to send a text message or in many countries in the world, they have a phone that is actually sponsored by a provider. For example, Facebook was very early on innovative and they said, we give you, the, we give you actually allow you to connect for free, but only to Facebook. M many countries in the world actually had the first connectivity by a service provider. And they say, you can connect for free, we, we cover the connectivity as long as you only use our service. And the internet would be a Facebook, which is still very extremely valuable, but is that real connectivity to whatever, to the entire internet and all the possibilities? So we have to think about how 
The bandwidth also has evolved because the hardware is only one. Let's look at the bandwidth and look at the software. So at the same time, the high income countries had 10 times more bandwidth. The divide was 10 to one. And then a few years later, the divide increased. Also, the let's say the rest of the world caught up from five kilobits in the year 2000, five kilobits per second to 50. So also during the seven year, great. They had much more bandwidth, so they caught up. Here the divide was five kilobits for the poorer part of the world compared to 50 kilobits per second for the rich part of the world. And then seven years later, they caught up. Now the rest of the world had 50 kilobits. Great, we caught up. Now we also have 50 kilobits in the poorer part of the world, but what happened in the meantime? Well, <laughs> the rich folks ran away, right? And they increased the divide to 18 times. So it's, it's a moving target. So the economists call this the red queen effect. Standing still means falling behind because we're all on a running belt. That actually comes from Alice in the Wonderland. Actually, I think when Alice went through the looking glass and well, in our country said Alice, still painting a little, you generally get somewhere else if you run very fast for a long time as we've been doing. A slow sort of country said the queen, the red queen. Now here in Wonderland, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. As I was like, run twice as fast as all the running you can do. It's kind of like, of course, it doesn't work. So you can imagine it's like this technological progress is a running belt. And we're all on this running belt. So if we stand still, we, we fall behind because it's, it's, it's continuing. Now we have to run on the running belt. And if you want to catch up, it's extremely difficult because technological progress keeps on going. So these two things are related technological progress and technological diffusion. And if we want to diffuse technology, we also have to consider what is it that we are diffusing and how does technological progress continue? And hence, if you talk about the digital divide and what kind of technology matters, it matters what, what you measure. So here I measured again bandwidth. I Over the years, I, I got tired of measuring the different technologies and the newest, latest thing. And it, it's great. You can always make a new headline. The digital divide is widening. It's closing. It's widening. It's closing. So actually, if you just measure bandwidth, I think that's what matters. Bandwidth is useful. You can connect to the cloud and to cloud computing and cloud storage. And do also, and it doesn't really matter if you have a phone or a computer or a laptop or a tablet. It's just what is the bandwidth of your communication channel. So that's what I measured here. And you can see this is a measure of inequality. It's the Gini coefficient. Some of you that work in inequality might be familiar with the Gini coefficient. It's just a measure of how big the inequality is. And you can see the divide has been closing here of bandwidth with the diffusion of the fixed line phone in the 80s. Much more fixed line phone came around, but then the mobile phone came around and the divide has been widening, especially with broadband in the early 2000s. I remember that very clearly. That was crazy how crazy the inequality became with some already adopting broadband fiber optics broadband, especially then. And that came out with the diffusion of mobile broadband. So now we had broadband on mobile phones and a lot of the developing world started to adopt that. So the inequality went up and then it went up again because then we went to 4G, 5G and so forth. So it's an endless story. Same as technological progress is an endless story. And with every new innovation, the divide opens up again. And then with diffusion, it is closed down again. Now, we can make that very complicated as well and go into the details, but the, the, keeping it simple, the basic takeaway that I want you to take away from here is that the divide is evolving. And in this paradigm, it's especially evolving, I think, especially towards bandwidth. It's not the number of devices that they are. If you take the number of devices here from the 80s, where basically there were only fixed line telephony around, you can see that the number of subscribers and the bandwidth is a one to one relationship because every device had the same communication capacity. Now, if you go forward to the 2000s, you can see, well, there's a big variety here. Some have devices that have more bandwidth and some have less bandwidth. And you can think about it in this three-dimensional shape here. When I map it on like this, that's what I showed you before. This is subscribers here and here you have the bandwidth and here you have income. And you can see, and this is the, really, this is just really for the rest of the nerds of us. <laughs> you don't need to, but it's interesting how you can think about it. So what countries do is they 
make sure that everybody has one device per person. So you need one kind of device, right? And when you reach one device, it doesn't depend on the income. Even poor countries migrate up here to reach one device per person. Everybody has one device. We can migrate up to two devices per person up here. And an average countries have between one and two devices per person. But then what happens once you reach that, the divide starts forming on with regard to bandwidth. And that is strong related to income. So that gets concerning now because income is notoriously unequal across the world. And if bandwidth here is connected basically one-to-one -one with income, then you know, the rich will push ahead and the poor will fall behind. Why is that? So, if, And if you're interested more in that, please read up on it. The citations are all there. The, the takeaway is that, right? The, the digital divide keeps on evolving. And why is that so concerning? Well, it's so concerning because bandwidth is becoming ever more and more important, especially as we migrate to more sophisticated applications, be that visually more sophisticated or computationally artificial intelligence more sophisticated. We need access to, to that and to the computational power as well. And we need access to the rendering of, if we want to be in the metaverse, to the hardware and the computational rendering for it, be, even if the computation is in the cloud. And this divide is already emerging and you can see that the bandwidth divide is far from being closed. I mean, we've been talking about that now for decades, but it's so far from being closed, you can see that, especially if you're a gamer, you know exactly what I'm talking about if you're into games, right? Most online games, they say they're real-time online games, but most online games, they still don't trust online. So what they actually do is they don't trust the bandwidth. Even here in our, the most developed, the richest countries, the bandwidth is just not reliable enough to go to this grand vision of whatever metaverse we wanna, we wanna be in uh, and the, the great AI simulations because we don't have enough stable bandwidth. So what they do is if you, for example, take Fortnite, Fortnite is a very popular online game, supposedly. Well, first of all, what you have to do is you have to download Fortnite on your computer. And on the PC, on the game, that is about 30 gigabytes. So 30 gigabytes you download. And then when you play online per hour, all you get transmitted is about 0 0.02 to 0 0.05 gigabytes. So that's in the best case, 600 times less than what you already have stored here in your computer. So what Fortnite is this online supposedly real-time game basically communicates very little and what it does, it plays things from your local computer. So actually your metaverse experience is generated what you downloaded before, what happens in real time, very few, very little instructions. And that happens as well with all these cool things that we, we hear about. For example, here, this concert, it was a 10 minute concert of a rapper, Travis Scott, that we actually performed also in Fortnite. And about 30 million unique players were in game participating in this, in this concert. Now that was the big headline. It's one of the first historic applications of this of this idea of 3D interaction in the metaverse. And the headline is, of course, is 30 million people were in the same virtual space. Now, is that true? Let's have a look at that. Well, first of all, everybody had to download and install an env environment beforehand. Same as the old trick with Fortnite. You first download it, it just takes some time, you have to install it here, and then you have it local. That's not online. You just you just run it locally. And then you know, you get some instructions of what plugs to pull. And usually Fortnite has 100 players per instant. But in that one, they said, that's just too much. Let's cut it to 50. So there were 50 player per instant. So that basically means that there were only 50 players in a room, not, not 30 million. There were 50 players uh, together in a room looking at what Travis Scott did there. But there were almost more than half a million different parallel rooms. Kind of like on a video conference in a breakout room. But so we went to half a million different breakout rooms and each one of them ran their parallel version. Now, were there 30 million together in one space? No, not really. You were together with 50 others and then we ran the same event half a million times. So that's actually what happened. And, and so it shows you that even in these most advanced applications, 
we don't have the bandwidth to, and we don't have the computational power to run them off. And as we transfer, uh, once we transmit it in the metaverse, that will be a big concern in, in order to have whatever augmented reality glasses that as you walk through the city, it displays something very quickly there. I mean, you need the computational power. How are you gonna get that? The computational power you need for the rendering, you need to log on to something in real time. You cannot load it on your glasses. That would be very heavy. And do we have enough computational power to make all these renderings all the time? So a lot of that is still quite far away as science fiction, but exponential technological progress will probably solve it pretty soon. Well, hopefully, in the meantime, we have to be concerned about this new inequality that's arising. Now, while this new inequality arises, there are also new terms we need to talk about. As I said, traditionally, the digital divide, we talk about subscriptions. But nowadays, you can also talk, you have to talk much more about bandwidth. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, when we suddenly all had to stay at home, you saw the more we stayed at home, the bandwidth, average bandwidth available for everybody dropped because we were competing for the bandwidth. It's just like when you try to watch a movie on Friday night and everybody else tries to watch the movie at the same time, right? It's just, it's just too much. So, so it, basically, it basically drops. And bandwidth is just one thing. We actually have to learn new vocabulary. There are things like latency and jitter. So what is latency? Latency, well, bandwidth is kind of like the transportation and latency is the reaction. So bandwidth is how quickly you can download or upload, pull data from a server. And latency or ping, they call it a ping, is how quickly is the reaction time after request. How can you think about that? So the latency is basically the ping is how fast you drive on the freeway, that's the speed. And the speed can be 100 miles or 150 miles. You just see like, oh, I ping, and how quick is the reaction time? And the bandwidth, now that's the freeway. And if they are, the bandwidth is very wide and a lot of cars can travel on it, then okay, but it also it ends on the speed and on the width of it. And usually, traditionally, we talk about bandwidth. That's all we consider about. But latency, and pings become very important, especially in the real-time world. If you're a gamer, again, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And as we all transition more into the virtual reality, it becomes much more important. And you can see that different countries, for example, have a different upload speed or, and or latency in it. So you can see here, for example, that's the, that's the bandwidth upload speed. And here you see the latency and you can see here for example, as the upload speed increases, the latency stays pretty constant in this one country, in Chile, whereas in another country, in Peru, you see that actually latency varies a lot. So when you game, that matters because, for example, if I have a sword fight and then I, I try to hit you, but it takes too long and then I suddenly get hit, it's like, what? No, I hit you first, but it wasn't communicated quickly enough. So Ping, latency, latency is very important. And you can see that here now as well, we can actually make that more sophisticated, talk about the jitter. And you will have to get used to these terms and we understand the digital divide because the digital divide is not anymore about who has a device and it's not even anymore about bandwidth. It has to do with, well, things like jitter. The jitter is the variability and latency over time. And as we migrate towards the metaverse, these things become more and more important. So. This has to do with the what. What kind of technology are we talking about? And so this was first the who connects to what question. And with these two questions, honestly, you can already answer like the vast majority of the questions related to the digital divide. So until now we talked about who, what is a node, connects to what? So, and that's the basic, that's the most important. But that you already understand most that you want, or you can conceptualize most that you want to understand about the digital divide. Like what is a node and when is a node connected? Like what are we talking about? What is the technology? And that's it, people or users, or people or organizations, country users, whatever is the who and what, what kind of digital technology, computation, communication or whatever, whatever you wish. That's the basic. Now. In the next few minutes, hopefully, uh, we will go through a little bit more detail uh, with regard to that. And that is because we can also characterize the users with different characteristics. And that's important if you try to make some policy because uh, it's not only who, it's what characteristics do they have. And some might connect 
quicker than others. That means that maybe you discover a trick in order to accelerate that, or you discover some that might need some help. So let's assume the node is a person. And um, let's see what are some characteristics. Well, one characteristics we already mentioned without making explicit is income. So if I have more income in this sense, I have more connectivity. This is a, a chart we made many years ago in Brazil, that's mobile phone penetration in Brazil. And you can see that more income, the income goes up here from the first quintile to the fifth quintile, the poorest 20%, the richest 20%, connectivity goes up. Richer people have more mobile phones. Now this is condition on everybody with a university education. How does it actually look on different levels of education? Well, we see actually an independent effect. We can see here that people with less education have less connectivity. So the people without any formal education, even so they are equally as rich, have less mobile telephony, are less connected to the digital realm. So these are some independent effects conditioned on the same amount of income, the same amount of richness, the more income I, the more education I have, the more connected and conditioned on the same amount of education. Here's university tertiary education, the more connectivity uh, I have with more income. Now, it's not really independent. Independent would be that they are orthogonal. Now, these effects are not truly independent. Independent, they would be just really orthogonal to each other. It's a joint distribution. That's the technical term here from probability theory and from statistics. So you can see in general, people with more income and more education have more connectivity. And the ones with less income and also with less education, these are the least connected, the ones here. So we have the two extremes here and here. And they're different characteristics that complement each other, sometimes potentiate each other, or there's a trade-off. And I spent quite some time in my career trying to understand that and finding the different patterns. Now, the truth is, even if you try to get all the variables, income, education, age, age is another important one here, for example, you can explain about half of the story. What I told you previously about the network structure is not considered here. That tells you the other half of the story. So you read, if you do research here, you read, re, need really complete data. Now, one important thing about doing statistics like that and calculating how can you actually explain, how can you predict who will connect or not? What are the characteristics? One important thing to consider here is that we're talking about statistics. And famously, as they say, there are three kinds of lies. There are lies, damn lies, and there are statistics, <laughs> which, which make all of that a little bit worse. And that has to do with confounding variables and the spurious correlation. So for example, back in the time when I was working at the UN, there was a big concern about that women are victims to the digital divide. So women are not connected enough. And that then led to policy projects where actually a lot of money and resources and energy and human resources were spent to set up projects to help women to get connected to the internet. And that back in these days, you know, the early 2000s, the talk was more about technophobic women and we need to set up courses. So if you have that interpretation, you need to set up courses in order to, you know, take the fear away from women to connect to technology. And where does that come from? Well, it came from statistics about the digital divide. So you see here, that men are more connected than women. Men are the red, they have higher connectivity than women. Hence, let's set up some courses and uh, these technophobic women, they must be there, let's, let's uh, educate them. Now, I personally never bought into that because I, from women in my family and in my family and in the workspace, I usually, uh, many in my team also in the UN, the vast majority in my team in the UN uh, were female researchers and we had a great team and I see like, well, women actually, they're much better communicators than men. So this is a communication revolution. So I never bought into the argument that women are somehow technophobic. And I, I looked at these courses that were designed on a massive scale and I couldn't really understand it. So I looked a little bit at the statistics and the question is, which characteristics do we actually have? And it turns out that women are discriminated in society in general, independent from the digital paradigm with regard to employment. Women have worse employment. Now, when they have worse employment, they also have less access to digital technology because you get additional access to digital technology through your employment. Your employer provides the connectivity. They also have less income. Women in general, they are generally discriminated. In a woman for the same amount of labor earns less. 
Now that's a discrimination that just comes from this. So if you have less money, you can buy less connectivity. Also women have less education and that has different reasons and it has to do also with, with social conventions and so forth. But in general, we can see that. Now, I started to control for this and what you do with spurious correlations with confounding variables, you just, uh, you take, for example, women with the same amount, with the same level of employment, same jobs, same income level and same education as men. And if you compare them to each other, it turns out that the fact of being a woman actually has a positive effect on ICT usage. Now, the effect in overall is negative, but only because women are discriminated in employment, income, and education. The fact of being a woman is positively correlated. They are more, actually better users of digital technology. Now, guess what? They are better users of digital technology. Women are natural communicators. Now, they can use these digital technologies in order to foster create more income, create more employment and education possibilities. So for example, even cultural conventions where women will stay home more with a family, now they can start a job and women all over the world have started that. Starting the business, just opening a, a site and company, promoting it on a social media site, a Facebook company, call it like that, right? That's been the, the pioneer role and a lot of Business can be done there. Just also being at home and increasing income, increasing education. Like that's what we are doing here right now, doing online education. You can do that. So see how that has very different implications for policy approach. Now, this is not about technophobic women. It says actually women are naturally more drawn to digital technology. They embrace it. Now, how can we foster that in order to fight existing inequalities? Leads to very different policy proposals here. So when you play with these statistics, you need to remember there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and there are statistics. And you can invent a lot of things if you don't look very closely at them. Last but not least, how do we connect? And that's a little bit different to like what kind of technology, because what I refer to here is not like the kind of technology, the bandwidth or the generation of technology, but more the social impact of it. Back at the UN, once they invited me to a school which supposedly was connected and they sent computers there and I went into the school in a rural area in a country far off and I found these computers, they were basically in boxes. They were still in boxes and the teachers just started to use them as tables. And they said, well, heck, we don't know what to do with these computers, but you know what we really need it? We needed tables. So this actually makes a perfect table. So they had the boxes with the computers and that's what they used. So it's not done by just you know, shipping technology out to the world. You also have to see how you can use it and what's the kind of impact that you use it for. And you can measure the divide in that sense here as well. For example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, what we did here is we looked how small and medium-sized companies, that's small companies with, you know, less than 50 employees, maybe 100 employees, family companies, you could see how they connected to the internet during the pandemic. And usually these companies, they don't invent their own web page. They go to a web page provider. One of the biggest one in the world is called Shopify. Kind of like gives you a framework and you just use that framework, it comes with everything, the transaction, you can do commerce with it, and then, you know, you modify it. And that's how we saw how many of these companies started to set up online shop during the pandemic. And you can see here that traditionally the growth was very low, then here in 2020, well, boom, it exploded. Many of companies here in Colombia, Chile, Brazil, and Mexico started to connect to set up shop in the internet. But how productive were they actually? What do they actually trade? Well. The vast majority had very few products online, maybe on average 25 products. So uh, that's not a lot of selection. Would you go to a web page if you can choose? Well, maybe if there's some one very popular product, but you can see there's a digital divide here. It's not only not even having connectivity and even setting up a web page with e-commerce functionality, then it's what's your offer? How effectively do you use this online space? And that's not only for companies, also for users during the pandemic. For example, these freelancer portals became very popular and these are bigger than entire economies. So they have more workers on there than entire economies have workers on there. Hundreds of thousands of workers offering their services. But what is it good for if you offer skills that nobody demands? So what we did here is we looked at the global demand of labor 
And what different countries, uh, we worked here with the United Nations Secretariat in Latin America, that's what we did this, this research study for. So you can, we can see in different countries, does the labor force that offers the labor potential on the online labor market actually fit the supply of labor, fit the global demand? Because being connected is only one thing. And even if you're connected with the right technology, how do you make use of it? And that's this last perspective that you can also talk about the digital divide in with regard to is it exit, is it usage, or is it impact and what kind of impact? All right, summing up, we had the question of who with which characteristics connects how to what. And that's how we can characterize the digital divide. And that leads to many interesting policy implications. Now, there's one big caveat. There are many, many definitions of the digital divide that just come out of here. So for example, imagine that I only have three different distinctions of who. For example, I can measure the digital divide between countries, between organizations, or between individuals. That gives me three different kinds of digital divides, right? And then imagine I have only four different characteristics, income, education, geography, and something else. Then imagine I have only three different distinctions between how you connect. Is it access, usage, or impactful adoption? And then what technology? Now, just say we measure six different ones, phones, internet, storage devices, and whatever, index. They call it ICT index, a combination, a basket of these technologies. Now, what do I end up with? Well, I have three times four times three times six. I have 216 different definitions of the digital divide or digital development for that matter. And now people come and ask me, so is the digital divide closed? And my first response will be like, what? Like, wait, what digital divide are you talking about from these 216 digital divides or 216 kinds of digital development, right? So, so at the end, there's not one digital divide that's to be closed. It's also constantly evolving with new technology. And already with all we have, we have hundreds of definitions of the digital divide. And long story short, what I came to at the end, it's a conditional definition, right? So you first of all have to ask yourself, what do you want to achieve? How do you want to make the world a better place? And then you define the digital divide. It's socially constructed. You need to know where you go. Because if you don't know where you want to go, where you want to navigate, no wind is favorable. First of all, decide where you want to go, how you want to make the world a better place. And then define the digital divide. So given the desired impact, who with which characteristic connects how to what, or normatively speaking, given the desired goal that you have, the development goal, who with which characteristics should best be connected how to what. And so with that, I leave you. I hope this little excursion on the, on the digital divide was insightful. And it's a discussion that very unfortunately will stay with us and will still wreak a lot of havoc in this world by introducing increasingly important additional dimension of social, economic, and cultural inequality.